really happy to be here. Um, I was at the other, the last meeting really um, briefly. And I think that the, my research, this, this kind of like, it was a really in good introduction, I think, for also some of the stuff that I, or context for a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about and the perspective that I have on, um, on the topic. So, um, yeah. So I want just to give a little bit of background. Um, I became interested in the topic of, of children and work um, about 20 years ago in, in Peru. Um, when I was, I was actually, it was kind of shortly after college and I was doing research in Peru that didn't, wasn't specifically related to, um, to working children, but um, it was related more to the NGO boom that was occurring during the um, sort of post-war, post-conflict moment in, in Peru. Um, I, at that time, I was working specifically in Ayacucho, which is, um, which is the, where the epicenter of the war between the Shining Path and the state was. Um, and it was, at, at one point I was invited by the, um, a couple of the organizations, the NGOs that I was shadowing to do, um, to go to a conference in Lima, the capital of Peru, um, that was organized by a, the funding agency, the, an agency that was funding several NGOs that were doing work on um, children's and youth sexual and reproductive health. And the, but the, the conference was more broadly about children's rights. Um, and as usual, it was a conference where everyone who was presenting were adults. Um, but interestingly, during, I think it was the second day of the, of the conference, um, I walked in and the people who were setting up to give their presentation were, were teenagers. Um, and of course, in that moment, I sort of became aware of my adult centrism because I was like so surprised that there were teenagers um, presenting on this topic. Um, and so basically these were these teenagers were um, were representatives from Peru's movement of working children. And um, El Movimiento Nacional. Well, there's actually two different working children's movements in Peru that are kind of related to each other. So I'll just say Peru's, men, Peru's working children's movement, just for, uh, for short. Um, anyway, but this is to say that while my research has taken different turns and it doesn't focus specific, exclusively on the movement for working children, um, I have been collaborating with and doing and doing research on the movement for um, the last 20 years. And I and to me, for me, I credit the movement with sort of my, with inspiring me to do this research. Um, and, and in particular, sort of inspiring me to um, unlearn my old, my own adult centrism and the ways that I think about work. Um, so I so so my book, for example, it involve it 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 does address the movement. There's a chapter that's exclusively about the movement, and then there's other. Um, it it built it kind of um, it kind of is woven in in different places. But my research really, and this was also with the um, encouragement of the um, my collaborators from the movement. I ended up when I was doing my field research, broadening it to um, do research largely with children who are not part of the movement as well. Um, so that's just to give you a sense of who of my work. Um, I won't talk very much about the movement today because I know there's other people here who, who um, have researched it and done research on, and written about it. And also that there will be a presentation in a couple of months by someone who's doing that, um, who, by someone on that particular topic. Um, so that is um, me. I have, um, I also, my, my research focuses on children who work um, on the streets and in public spaces, um, whether it's juggling, windshield washing, um, do, um, selling or performing on buses, right? Um, 
But I also do, I've also done a lot of work shadowing um, NGOs and, um, and, and worker and, and people who work for state agencies. Um, so I'm an ethnographer, I, um, and I, but my work is historically grounded. Um, so I look a lot at um, colonial legacies um, and how that those influence the experience of children in Peru today. So that's um, that's sort of my um, my broad introduction. Um, I want to um, so in term, I'm going to share my screen actually just to talk about the what I, how the way that I'm thinking of affective labor. Um, Okay. Um, so I use the, the concept of affective labor to um, discuss the intergenerational work that children and mothers specifically perform together under, under patriarchal capitalism um, and under the neoliberal iteration of patriarchal capitalism. So what is affective labor? So just to give some background, um, that a lot of people might be familiar with. Um, in the 1970s, um, it, Marxist feminists began talking about um, women's unpaid reproductive labor, the kinds of work that is often called caring labor today um, that women do inside of the structure of the patriarchal nuclear family, right? Where, um, where that can include childcare, but is not limited to that, right? So it can also include um, cooking, cleaning, and all the different sorts of work that involve um, an investment of emotion. Um, and then sort of that discussion was, um, was broadened by um, other feminist scholars to talk about the commodification of women's care work. So what happens when this sort of work is given an exchange value and not only a use value, right? Um, and so um, someone that's associated with this, um, with, this, with this idea is Arlie Hochschild, who, um, taught, who wrote a book about the commodification of workers' emotions. Um, that's her, sort of her definition of emotional labor. Um, and the main example that she uses, the case study is airline workers. Um, so basically how people are investing their own emotions in the sort of service work that they do. And they're all, and the idea is that they're also provoking certain um, emotional responses on the part of their clients, right? On the part of their, their consumers. Um, and then affective labor is a concept um, that addresses the idea of Im it's immaterial labor, right? It has an in-person aspect um, and it involves the creation and manipulation of affects. But one of the main, again, I'm not really interested in like hard and fast definitions of these terms. Um, I don't think, I think these are, these are um, broad terms and they're flexible and we can use them in different ways and I'm interested in talking about them. So I just want to emphasize here that this is not um, this is not necessarily a hard and fast um, and set in stone definition of affective labor, but the idea about of affective labor is that it accounts for the sort of work that we do in this post Fordist moment, right, um, where there is not as much, there's, there's not this sort of separation of public and private, right, that Marx talked about, that Marx was sort of referring to or assuming um, that the, that industry, um, you know, most, we live in, an, in a world where most people, and in, in Peru, where I do my research, most people work in the, what's called the informal economy, another very complex kind of topic that it, or, it, or a term that, um, that we can sort of problematize and talk about. Um, so the idea is that we 
are all at some point um, doing, we're all, we're all involved in affective labor um, in the kinds of work that we do, um, regardless of our nationality, our class status, our gender, all of these things. But I, what I think is important and some of the critiques that have been made of, the, of affective labor scholars is that they don't necessarily, but in, in saying that we all do affective labor and, it's, and, and we're all doing it all the time in our workplaces and beyond, and it can also kind of lose its meaning. And so um, I want to make sure, I wanna talk about four different kinds of labor that, um, that Oksala refers to in sort of differentiating between what, like that affective labor is a useful concept, but these are the different kinds of labor that it, in, that it, um, that it, that it encompasses and it's important to think about them all. And so um, I'm going to stop. Um, so, so one of the kinds is care work that is not commodified. So that would be sort of like, the, mar the, reproduct the reproductive labor that Marxist feminists were talking about. And then there's the care work or reproductive labor that is commodified um, and as such productive labor. Um, then there, and so that could include, for example, the kind of work that people, like paid, people who are paid to be child care workers, right? Or different kinds of care workers. Um, the waged labor that, does not directly reproduce labor power, but instead aims at producing affects, right? And then also unwaged labor that does the same. So these are different ways of thinking about sort of how we might break down the idea of affects labor, but I think it's helpful to think about those four different types in terms of thinking about the work that children do. So I want, I'm gonna share my screen also share with you the um, article, like some sites and the articles that I'm pulling these ideas from. I don't want to get bogged down in like citing people right now in this short presentation, but I will, of course, I'm happy to share all of my um, references. So here we go again. So the, the issue about, um, for me, as sort of a, a feminist scholar and a scholar of labor and also a scholar of children and childhood is that like children don't really appear in these discussions about affective labor. Um, if anything, they tend to figure as objects of women's care, right? As sort of passive recipients of women's caring aid, labor and not as agents or as workers themselves. Um, and different um, scholars, there's recently a, um, a book published um, that actually that addresses this issue of how do we sort of bring together feminism and childhood studies without conflating women and children into sort of a naturalized category that um, are sort of reifying the relationships between women and children in ways that reproduce patriarchy. Right? Um, I think one thing that's important to take into account though, is that um, even in these like, kind of 20th century and 21st century discussions about affective labor um, that don't discuss, that don't really address children as agents, it's when we look historically at um, the history of Peru, which is the country that I work in, um, but I would argue that this is, you know, this is relevant in different places although it looks different in different places, that um, the, the, the patriarchy as a concept that was used um, as part of the colonial project, right? Um, of Spain sort of setting up its empire in, in what is now Peru. Um, patriarchy was about regulating the family in a very particular way and about men's domination over not only women, but also children and also ultimately servants and enslaved people. Um, 
So patriarchy um, has always been about generation and not just gender. Um, again, I won't go into great detail about this, but there is, I can answer questions about it. And also um, the historian Bianca Premo um, has written an excellent book about that topic. Um, so what I, and, and in this one particular chapter of my book that I'm working on right now, I'm thinking about children and mothers as laboring units. Um, and again, I'm trying to do this without reifying the, child, the women and children relationship, right? But rather understanding that we as humans are interdependent. Um, and yet these particular dependencies and vulnerabilities reflect people's structural positions. So the facts that I found in my research that children always sort of invoked their mothers when they talked about their own work. Um, I don't, this isn't because of some sort of natural connection necessarily between children and mothers, but because of the way that children and mothers have been sort of structurally positioned in relation to each other um, within a context of patriarchal capitalism. Um, and so I use the concept of affective labor to think about not only about children's work um, independently, but also about this intergenerational work that they that children do with their parents, usually their mothers. And I also I want to argue that we can't think about children's work without thinking about this intergenerational aspect of the work of work, and without thinking about women's um, women's particular um, relationship to affective labor. So um, I'm curious, I want to, I, 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 I'm bringing up a couple of examples that I'll let you read. Um, I have, I mean, I can bring up, it was hard to choose which examples, it was almost random because my argument is that everything is affective labor and all of the work that, the, that I see in my research with children is affective labor. But I'm gonna um, put up this particular quote right here. And I'll give you a moment to read it and we can talk about it if you want, or um, we can tease it out, but we can also talk about how you see this coming up in your own work. And just to give some context, Yasselin was a, an 11 year old girl who came with her mother who was blind to one of the main intersections in a middle, upper middle class zone of Lima where I conducted my research. Um, and she was some, she, she helped her mother with the commute from where they lived, which is an hour and a half away. And it took a couple of different buses to get there. So she helped her mother with the commute home, or I'm sorry, from home to the, to the workplace and back. And then her mother was a beggar at the intersection who would go around from car to car with the help of another, with, of other children who worked at the intersection doing juggling. They would take turns helping her and actually also another blind adult going car to car asking for money. Um, and during this time, Yoselin would either just kind of hang out um, by the kiosk, which was run by two women, or she would um, sell her own products, um, like visors or you know pens, different things. Um, she also had a younger sister, Sandrita, who was a few years younger than her, and they had sort of this family division of labor where most of the days that Yotelin came to the intersection, Sandrita would stay home and take care of household tasks. 
like cooking and cleaning. Um, but then sometimes they would switch off and Yosuin would stay home. Sandrita would come with her mother, help her to the intersection and hang out at the intersection while her mom was working. Um, and yes, I consider begging to, in this case, to be a form of work, if, you want, if you're interested in talking about that and as a form of affective labor. So, um, so kind of in this, and then this is sort of Jocelyn's idea about what we were having a conversation about her work. And she had this, um, she, she, she talked about this idea of a second mother, how she's a second mother to her, to her sisters. Um, she also had a baby sister. And so I asked her to clarify what this meant. And this was her response. Um, and then this is also just a short um, quote. And this was the prelude that Paco, who was a boy who got up on the buses with his sister and they did a musical routine and then asked people for money. Um, this was what he would say before he would begin his routine. So just in conclusion, I think that affective labor is a concept that can that allows us to visibilize and value children's work. Again, I take from Peru's movement of working children the idea that we need to engage in a critical valuation of children's work. So it allows us to visibilize and value children's work while also enabling us to see how this work is situated within patriarchal capitalism and within broader systems of exploitation. So any questions?